Okay, so this is the last fluid and electrolyte lecture from PowerPoint here. So what we want to keep in mind is that there are a lot of people who are at risk for fluid and electrolyte um, imbalances. So here we have kind of an overall list of things. I'm going to point out a few. Um, what we have here are chronic diseases and conditions. So especially those people with lung diseases, we really have to watch anybody who is um, you know, breathing very heavily or very rapidly. These are, um, these are people who are likely to be losing a lot of fluids through their respiratory tract. We also have patients who have, you know, heart disease, kidney disease, so they're not able to regulate their fluids as you would normally expect. Uh, diabetes, that has a lot to do with acid base imbalance. Um, so let's take a look at those with malnutrition, of course, will have fluid and electrolyte issues. Acute conditions, gastroenteritis or bowel obstruction, anybody with a head injury, that can cause some very specific issues with fluid regulation, but also just somebody who's not conscious or not able to make decisions about whether or not they are you know, even thirsty or able to get fluids. Trauma, so those burns or crushing injuries, keep those in mind, especially with potassium levels going high because they get released from the cells. Obviously, surgeries, fevers, anything that causes diaphoresis, lots of drainage, things like that. Of course, medications like diuretics or corticosteroids, non-steroidal um, non anti-inflammatory drugs, um, medications, IV therapies, anytime we are treating somebody with an IV therapy, especially if we are treating a hyper state, whether it's excess fluids or excess, um, um, excess electrolytes, anytime we're treating somebody for that, whether it's IV fluids or just medications, we have to watch that they don't go to, into a hypo state. So we have to be really careful with that and vice versa. Uh, and then, of course, the very um, old, very young, and then those uh, unable to access food and fluids independently. So this is just a review. You've had all of this information before, the things that you want to look at. So please take a look through this. I've mentioned a lot of these, but you want to watch you know, your pulses. You want to watch your skin. Um, mucous membranes. We have to keep track of that cardiovascular system, and we're going to do some case studies that help with that. Of course, respiratory system, neurological system. Now, you are going to be recording intake and output in anybody with a fluid or electrolyte imbalance, and there are some things, you know, especially if a patient is on like a fluid restriction, we want to help them plan out their fluids so we come up with a plan so that they're not consuming all of their fluids at one time or very early in the day. Make sure that they're spread out throughout the day and evening hours. Here are just a review that you are responsible for any of the labs that I put in your flashcards. So please make sure that you are reviewing those, that you get those memorized. Now we're going to spend some time talking specifically about certain intravenous solutions. So you do have a little matching on your, um, that's specific to IV solutions on your matching sheet for fluid and electrolytes. So what I would like you to, the way that I'd like you to learn these is first you need to know what your isotonic solutions are. So we have that 0.9% sodium chloride or normal saline, we have lactated ringers, and we have 5% dextrose in water. Now, when you think about those, those are your middle ground, okay? If it is less concentrated than that, if there's less um, solutes in it, particles in it, then it is gonna be a hypotonic solution. If there is more in it, it is going to be a hypertonic solution. Now, keep in mind, we don't use these hypo and hypertonic solutions without people being in you know, more distress. These are generally used in ICU areas. They're not something that we see a lot just on a general med search floor. They usually need to be under close watch. So 
I'm gonna, um, again, anything that is less concentrated. So if I have a 0.9% sodium chloride, if I look at my hypotonic solutions here, I have 0.45, which is half sodium chloride, and 0.33, which is a third sodium chloride. So those are less concentrated than just general normal saline, which is 0.9. Therefore, those are considered hypotonic, okay? A hypertonic solution is going to have more in it. So if I take regular normal saline and add 5% dextrose to it, that's more concentrated than just normal saline. Even if I take a half normal saline, and add 5% dextrose to it. Remember that if we look at the isotonic solutions, 5% dextrose just in water was isotonic. So 5% dextrose in normal saline, normal saline is gonna be more concentrated than water, even a half normal saline is more concentrated than water, then that is going to be a hypertonic solution. And then of course, if I take lactated ringers, which is isotonic and add 5% dextrose, that's gonna be a hypertonic solution. So you do wanna read through this chart. Um, it gives some good information. The one thing I do want to point out is that 5% dextrose in water or D5W is isotonic, but as that dextrose is metabolized, it becomes free water. So we have to watch that in patients at risk for increased intracranial pressure because it can cause cerebral, cerebral edema. It would basically be giving them an extremely hypotonic solution. So small amounts of that are used, but we do have to be careful that it doesn't cause more issues and, and make the person um, end up in an overhydration state. Okay, so here's a picture of what's going on. So if I have an isotonic solution and I administer that isotonic solution, they equal osmolality. So between the plasma and the fluid that I'm putting in via IV, there isn't really any net change. Things move around a little bit, but there's not any net change in osmolality or concentration. When I give a hypertonic solution, it increases the osmolality in the plasma water is going to move from the cells and in the interstitial fluid to the plasma. So it expands the plasma volume. Okay. It shrinks the cells and expands the plasma volume. Hypotonic does the exact opposite. So if I make the plasma concentration less by giving a hypotonic solution, water is going to move from the plasma to the interstitial spaces and in the cells. And so my plasma volume is going to be less and it is going to expand the cells, okay? So again, here's what uh, cells look like in an isotonic solution and what they look like under a microscope. They stay normal. Here's what cells can look like in a hypertonic solution. So it can cause those cells to shrink. And under a microscope, you can see they don't look nice and full anymore. And then a hypotonic solution, which causes the water to go into the cells, the cells can um, expand and eventually burst. And so that's what you see here. You see very bloated cells that have burst. So um, again, you you've have learned this. We need to make sure that you're looking at infiltration, phlebitis. Um, those are the two that you really need to pay attention to. And here's just an overall case study. It might be a good way to look at, you know, what is going on with a particular patient. You do have some signs and symptoms. You have a deficient fluid volume. Um, so you have your nursing diagnoses, you have outcomes, and you have some interventions here. So that can be helpful just to kind of review. What we will be doing um, next, especially over next week, is I will have you start working on the case studies that are in your course pack, and then I will record some videos going over those course pack pieces. All right, thanks.
And here are just a couple practice questions. So when you are ready, make your answer. I'm going to reveal the answer as B. We lose a lot of potassium through the GI tract. Okay, hopefully you've read the question. Um, I am going to reveal the answer, so pause if you haven't yet. The key here is that the GI symptoms have subsided, so we can do oral rehydration therapy with a solution containing glucose and electrolytes. We need to not just replace the, the fluids, but also the electrolytes, and our first choice is always oral rehydration. This is a otherwise healthy person. So we want to try to do the oral rehydration whenever possible. Thanks.